Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the George S. and Dolores Dore Eccles Foundation and the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, state and local leaders come under fire as Utah grapples with another surge in COVID-19 cases. Utahns react to the death and legacy of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And once again, the Supreme Court becomes a focal point of the upcoming presidential election as the Senate prepares for a charged confirmation battle. Good evening and welcome to the Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Tanya Vea, senior vice president and general manager of KSL TV and KSL News Radio, and Chris Blake, lobbyist with RRJ Consulting, and Representative Brian King, minority leader of Utah's House of Representatives. Thank you all for being with us today. Uh, wow, as we get ready for this next election, all sorts of things are happening in politics. But I wanna start with something that the, the nation is thinking about today. With you, Representative King, first of all, we lost uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, our Supreme Court Justice. Take a moment as a legislator, but also as an attorney, talk about her impact uh, on, on, the, on law, but also on our country. Well, one of the things that uh, I'm proud of is being a member of the ACLU of Utah Board of Directors. And for years, uh, Justice Ginsburg was part of the project at the ACLU nationally to bring greater prominence to and greater rights to work women across the country. And that's, of course, uh, in a series of Supreme Court cases that she argued, that's how she made her name in terms of a legal expert and scholar and advocate. And she was also a professor of law. But when I got this word that she had passed, I, I was devastated. I, it was unexpected. I mean, we knew that she was struggling with health issues, but it's a real loss for the country. I, I think that one of the great things about her is the uh, example and uh, uh, that, she, that she is of for women across the country. I've got four daughters. Uh, I'm very proud that they view her as a worthy example of advancement for women and women's rights across the country. Mm -hmm. uh, Tanya, we were able to re receive comments from many elected officials and people from all across the country who had some kind of impact on, 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 the, on, this, on this, uh, this country in terms of the rule of law. And they all had something to say about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I want to read this quote from Governor Gary Herbert. Give your comment, a comment on this, but also what you're hearing from these elected officials. Governor Herbert said she had a keen intellect and a tremendous work ethic. She broke through countless barriers, shattering ceilings and leading the way for women to have more involvement in government. She was a true pioneer in every sense. I really appreciated the governor's um, words and I thought that he struck exactly the right tone about Justice Ginsburg and her legacy. Uh, referencing her as a true pioneer in Utah, I'm not sure that there is any greater honor <laughs> coming from a Utah politician. Um, but I appreciated that he acknowledged her legacy and, and seeing what she did, um, not really, not just for women, but for, for all Americans, uh, for men as well. So equal under the law became more equal under the law, certainly because of Justice Ginsburg's work. Yeah, no question. That's what everyone's talking about, too. And that was a consistent theme through her time in office as well. And ev but even as we are commemorating that life well lived and the tremendous impact that she had on the rule of law, but also in, in terms of shattering bar barriers, Chris, it immediately became political <laughs> also. It, it did. You know, I think one of the great legacies of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is that she actually was a practitioner of judicial restraint. Uh, and I think that should be an important part of the court as we move forward. Forward. You know, she, uh, you know, very carefully selected the cases that she thought would go forward, but talked a lot about even, um, uh, as I understand it, about Roe v. Wade, that the court shouldn't substitute its judgment for that of legislative bodies or the public in general, as in, in terms of how it moves forward and it governs. And I think that is the right chord that should be struck and that the court should be looking towards is a little bit of judicial modesty and restraint and not as an arbiter or a super Congress, which is, uh, which I think is the appropriate role of the court. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that, Representative? Because that's something people always ask. I know when the governor is trying to appoint judges, when the president tries to decide, there's always this little thread right here is who is ultimately responsible? Is the, is the court responsible for deciding 
uh, the, the laws themselves, or maybe you as a lawmaker. Talk about that balance. Well, there is a separation of powers issue and a balance of power, and there's inherent tension there. That's the way it should be. The founders of our Constitution set up that way as a check and balance. So reasonable minds can disagree about the scope of authority of one branch of government versus another. The thing that I remember about her is that she was principled, and it's one of the things that I've actually always appreciated about Utah's governors over the past few decades, that they have been committed to a appointing judges and justices to our district court and appellate court and Supreme Court in the state of Utah without taking into account what the ideological perspective was or what the agenda was. They were just looking for lawyers who were going to be appointed that did the right thing by their own lights and were guided by the rule of law, had respect for the federal and state constitution, and were principled individuals. And that's something that uh, we need to see in all Supreme Court justices mm -hmm. and appointments to the court by the President of the United States as well as the Governor of the State of Utah. Okay, well, let's talk about this appointment that's coming up. Chris, let, let's, let's get into this just for a moment because uh, we have an opportunity mm -hmm. here to potentially have another Supreme Court nominee put forward under the Trump administration. Uh, let's talk about what's happened this week uh, as it comes to that replacement because you immediately have a couple senators and they're the ones going to be responsible for this after the nominee comes forward. You have two senators, uh, Senator Collins. Senator Murkowski saying, I don't think that President Trump should put forth a name and we as a Senate should not n nominate anyone. We're too close to an election, just let it wait. Talk about the politics of that question. Well, I, I mean, it's obviously, uh, that, that I, I don't think that position is going to hold out, uh, particularly if, you know, as we saw Senator Romney indicate that he was willing to have a vote. The politics seem to be that President Trump will nominate a justice and, uh, and, and the Senate will hear it. And so there's gonna, going to be a lot of twists and turns, I'm sure, uh, between now and whenever that confirmation happens, whether it happens before or shortly after the election. You know, there are some interesting components in terms of that timing uh, relative to the Arizona Senate seat. Yeah. Uh, because that's actually a special election, so it could change when that person is appointed. But, uh, you know, the, the Republicans are going to have to grapple with the issues of uh, hypocrisy, the, the way that they uh, held out the seat for Merrick Garland. And, uh, and you know, you, you, you're going to see that uh, play out in, in real time. Mm -hmm. uh, Tanya, because I know you're following this so closely, too, a lot of attention got immediately put on Mitt Romney. Some people thought maybe, you know, Mitt Romney has not exactly been the most uh, ardent supporter of President Trump. Maybe he would be one that would push back and say, let's just wait, all right? Let's wait till, the, till after the election. But he didn't do that. Talk about what his approach was and maybe some of the reasons why. Senator Romney's um, approach actually didn't surprise me at all. And uh, I think that him not being there in 2016, you know, he doesn't have uh, certainly <laughs> the uh, put me on tape record that, that Len Lindsey Graham does. Um, but I I think that Senator Romney is doing what Senator Romney has done throughout this entire thing, and he's following his conscience. He's, he, I'm certainly not presuming to speak for the senator in any way, uh, but but it, his his position on this didn't surprise me. Okay, uh, let's take this, because Representative King, we have talked in the past, in the last time on the Hinkley Report, with you specifically about Mary Garland and about whether or not his name went forward, but it, it didn't, it was no vote on it in the Senate. You had some opinions about that. Please put kind of overlay that with what's happening right now, because that was earlier in the cycle. That was like January, February before the election. This one's, well, I forgot, 40 days. Right, right. So back in 2016, we lost Antonin Scalia very unexpectedly. It was the end of January of 2016 in the middle of a presidential election, but several months away, uh, a full year from the time that the new president would take office. And yet we had Mitch McConnell, who was the leader in the, uh, of the Senate at the time, the uh, majority leader, say, I'm not going to bring this vote to, I'm not going to bring the nominee, Merrick Garland of President Obama, to a vote. Uh, you've seen Senator Lee say, we did our advice and consent. No, there was no advice and consent done by the Senate. That never had a, a chance to come before the group. So when it's, it's disappointing to me that Senator Romney says, I'm going to go with historical precedent. Well, historical precedent was changed in 2016, very clearly and expressly and unequivocally by Mitch McConnell. And now what you see is in the name of political expediency, we're going to flip back and say, oh, well, for various reasons, most of which I think are uh, rationalizations, you have individuals saying, now we're going to consider with less than 40 days 
about 40 days before uh, the election, will consider a nominee from President mm -hmm. Trump rather than the new president that will come in place if there is a new president in January of 2021. Now, it could be that President Trump gets reelected, of course, and it's all a nullity. But if, in fact, he's not reelected and you have Joe Biden coming in as the president, basically what you're saying in the name of political expediency is we're going to do in a pure power play move what we need to do to pack the court. Mm -hmm. So, Chris, let's get to the other side of this, because I want to get to this, this precedent that Representative was talking about, because Mitt Romney addressed that in a, a, a quote that he sent out about re the, his reason for saying he would proceed forward with this nominee, whoever it is. And this is what he said, because I want to get this other side and see what you have to say about that. Mitt Romney said, the historical precedent of election year nominations is that the Senate generally does not confirm an opposing party's nominee, but does confirm a nominee of its own. The Constitution gives the president the power to nominate and the Senate the authority to provide advice and consent on Supreme Court nominees. So that's the other side of this, this coin, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to disappoint you a little bit, Jason. I, I don't necessarily disagree with Representative King in terms of his perspective on this. And my, my concern in, was the same in 2016. I think they should have uh, taken up the nomination of Merrick Garland. And if they didn't like it, vote it down. And I think that would have been the more appropriate uh, approach to take, because now they, they, they do have this problem now of saying we're going to take this up. I don't necessarily, I don't have a problem with them taking it up. I think it, it is appropriate. A justice has died. That is the process uh, to do it. But I think they also should have done the same thing in 2016. And if they didn't like Merrick Garland or felt like he wasn't appropriate, vote him down and move forward. And so that, that's sort of the, the conflict I have myself. But uh, I don't have a problem with them moving forward. It is the appropriate role of, you know, the, the of, of each of those people that are that are doing their part here. Mm -hmm. As we talk about this, Tanya, I think it's interesting if you go back to 2016 and you talk to Utahns about why they voted for President Trump, because he did get the, well, the not the majority of the votes, but he got a, the largest percentage in the state of Utah. If you ask Utahns why, one of their top reasons was the Supreme Court, uh, whoever these nominees are going to be. It remains a very high item for Utahns. Why is that? And do you think that um, that is as, as big of an issue for voters this year in Utah as they decide on who they're going to vote for? I certainly think it is for President Trump's base and for a large number of Republican voters in, in Utah. Uh, for the Democrats, nationally, the Supreme Court has become suddenly a very significant issue mm -hmm. <laughs> in this election. Um, but, but I just still can't help but think it's going to be the economy, it's going to be coronavirus that are the most significant issues weighing on voters' minds uh, right now. and and. Will the court go forward with a vote? Yes, in all likelihood, it looks like it's going to go forward. If you're listening to what a lot of senators are saying on the record, they've already said, without even knowing who the nominee is, that they're going to vote in favor. That's very concerning to me. That's something that is um, more concerning, frankly, than them pushing through and rushing through a vote. Not before an election, we're actually in an election. This is a different election year, and early voting is underway in many states. It's about to get underway in Utah. So, so to say it's before an election is actually not quite accurate. It's we're in an election. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about this um, this interest in the Supreme Court, uh, Representative King, because I find it interesting. There was a recent uh, Pew poll uh, done, uh, and this is what was interesting about Democrats, because this was just done July through August, and this is what they said: uh, Are you interested in the Supreme Court nominee, and how, and what percentage? you think this is one of the top priorities. 66% of Democrats said uh, the United States Supreme Court pick is their number one issue, as opposed to 61% of Republicans. That wasn't always the case with Democrats, but it seems like it is now. Yeah, that's a flip. One of the things that conservatives have done a much better job than liberals and Republicans have done a much better job than Democrats have in the past few decades is focus on the importance of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Educate people who were disposed to belong to those ideologies or those political parties to recognize how important it is in terms of the presidential election. And they were right. And I think that Democrats now have come around, they've recognized and been educated over the last few years about just how important the presidential election is in terms of who ends up on the Supreme Court. So it doesn't surprise me that Democrats are finally coming around saying this is critically important. It is critically important. And I hope, we'll see, but I hope that that is the effect of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death and the appointment in the middle of an election, as Tanya says, of, uh, of this new justice 
uh, is going to energize to a greater degree the left side of the political spectrum, the Democrats, to get out and vote as opposed to having the Republicans be energized. Both parties will be energized. It's all an incremental thing. And as you know, about only 10 percent of the population hasn't made their mind up firmly about who they're going to vote for for president. So it's a small slice, but a critically important slice. Okay, I want to get to that one. Oh, go ahead, Chris. Well, I was going to say, I don't know that I agree with Representative King on this. Republicans have been horrible at appointing Supreme Court justices. Democrats, you know, as they appoint Supreme Court justices, they always stick together. Republicans are flipping all over the place. They can't. They can't figure out what kind of justice to to uh, to nominate because they end up all across the the ideological spectrum. The the concern I have is that this is. Uh, such a prim primacy issue within this election. I think it is inappropriate and it disappoints me. And I think it speaks to the failure we see at in Congress for them to not legislating. These issues are political issues. They should be decided by the public, by our elected officials, and not by Supreme Court justices. And I just, I think it is such a failure uh, at the the legislative branch to figuring out how to, how to actually govern and move the f country forward rather than we're all focusing on justices, which I don't believe should matter at the level that they do. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, let's talk about uh, this idea that Representative King just mentioned. He said most people have made up their minds. Of course, making up your mind and turning in your ballot are <laughs> two different things. Uh, and I'm curious, uh, Tanya, about some of the rhetoric coming out of the Washington D.C. The, the last few days, particularly when questions are asked of President Trump uh, about whether or not he's go will accept the results of this election. That has become something a lot of people are talking about. Why is that? And then kind of talk about this issue with the ballots that he keeps referring to. This is deeply concerning, and I, I think that journalists should be taking this very seriously. Uh, they seem to be, they're pressing on this, that uh, the public should be taking this seriously, and, and frankly, our elected officials should, should be, some of them have come out in opposition to it, but not enough. I mean, there is nothing more fundamental than uh, the tr peaceful transition of power. People need to feel confident about that. So regardless of, of who that winner is, if that's President Trump or if that's um, Joe Biden, Vice President Biden. Yeah, that's a very serious, concerning um, statements coming from the President of the United States. Uh, I don't know yeah. what else to say about it. Yeah, so, so it is interesting. So which makes me wonder, Chris, to what Tanya was just saying and think she's right. Is this real? I mean, is that a real deal that he's talking about or is this, is this a motivating factor or something else? Yeah, I, I tend to believe that it's President Trump playing playing what he likes to do, and that is uh, make the media agitated and get them worked up, uh, s speak to whomever, you know, about, about elections. Mm -hmm. Because I know that uh, there was a great political article just, uh, I think, yesterday or the day before talking about the 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 what's going on within the White House uh, around the transition, whether that's yeah. to a second term of President Trump's or whether it's to Joe Biden. And so at the end, I think the levers of government, the, those institutions will, you know, tr transition power or continue to the second term, whichever is appropriate. But he loves to own the media and play up that that place. And cons a lot of conservatives really like it, rightly or wrongly. Mm -hmm. I, I want to get to this mail-in balloting issue that? just for a second. Can I just jump in on that? Yeah, please. In owning the media, and I understand, you know, he comes out of he comes out of uh, entertainment. We aired him on on our network for quite some time, so he understands how to do that. But he's also in doing that, he's doing damage to democracy. So totally, totally. I mean, here's the thing: we, we I, I don't disagree with Chris when he says, you know, to ex some extent, it's playing the media and playing uh, with minds of people, the liberals, you know, owning the libs, as he and some of his supporters like to say. But he's also very serious. Anybody who thinks that Donald Trump isn't intent on doing whatever's necessary to retain power is fooling themselves. He said in 2016, the only way I lose is if this election's rigged. He said it again most recently. He really honestly believes in his own heart and mind, and he wants everyone else to believe that if he wins, it's a perfectly appropriate election, and it was well carried out, and it's full and fair and, and appropriate. But if he loses, it's rigged. And, and that is, as Tanya's saying, devastating mm -hmm. to what we in this country have cherished for over 200 years. One of the reasons that George Washington is viewed as one of the greatest leaders that we've ever had is his willingness after two terms to say, I'm going to peaceably allow transition of power and I'm going to retire. That was not a, a given at that time. Hmm. Um, 
Going to the, the election process itself, to, to get to your issues of, of, the, of democracy and the republic as it goes forward, uh, this, this kind of protection of the ballot box is absolutely critical. Uh, but Utah is interesting in that it's been leading the way for a long time on this mail-in balloting. I have one small question for you, Representative, and then Chris, to talk about this. You rely, as in your position, uh, on mail-in balloting right now. Are you concerned that it is not going to work, that the Postal Service will do something and there's an ability to rig your own election. Are you worried about that? Well, I, <clears throat> I, I give credit to those who work on a day-to-day -day basis within the Postal Service. They're great public servants. They do hard work it's, and they do it well. So in that sense, I'm not worried about the Postal Service doing its job. Uh, I, I, I'm concerned that the Postmaster General, who Trump has appointed and Trump himself, will do what they can to tinker with that process and try to interfere with it. But I have uh, doubts about their ability to really interfere with it substantially because people are watching it very closely. The fact is, as you alluded to, Utah has, and many other states, have done uh, mail-in balloting for years. We've done it as a country for years for our service people across the, uh, when they're away from their homes. It's never been subject to high degree of fraud. Uh, despite what Donald Trump says over and over again, he's never been able to prove that there's any substance behind his allegations that this is a mm -hmm. way that is susceptible to being rigged or, or fraudulent. This is something that we need to preserve, it's something that we need to support, and it's something that we need to build people's confidences in as opposed to eroding that confidence. You know, my bigger concern is we, we have to recalibrate how we think about election night uh, as we look at mail-in ballots, and we've seen this here in Utah at, under this process, you know, the election night results which we used to think were, okay, that's done, let's move forward, aren't the case. And we live in such a, an environment now where we want immediate gratification results. Let's tell me, move, I'm ready to move to the next thing. And that's not going to be the reality of this election. And so that, that uncertainty, uh, as we have to recalibrate what election night means or what the election process means. I mean, Tanya referred to this, there are ballots being cast right now. And that's what concerns me is just the way that people look at election night and what, what those results mean. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the key connections to why we're doing mail-in balloting, even though Utah's been doing this for a while, was the country is COVID-19. This is one of the things we're trying to do to make sure people can still participate. Uh, Tanya, this has been a, a rough go in the state of Utah the last few days. Uh, just on Thursday of this last week, a record uh, number of, uh, of people uh, testing positive in the state of Utah. The, po the, the political implications of the rise right now in the state of Utah. It's significant, and I think that um, I'm speaking as a first as a business uh, leader in in this capacity. But we need to get this under control, and and primarily for people's health, but also for our economy. It's really I see it like a, a teeter totter, where if you're keeping the virus under control, you're also keeping the economy balanced, and the state has done an exceptionally good job of that, in my opinion. Uh, especially considering that the, the uh, strategy from the White House seems to be deny and let die in some, in some capacity. And the governor has had to overcome messaging that is different and problematic uh, coming, out of, coming out of Washington than what he's been trying to do in the state. So where I think the focus has been really uh, two part on the economy and on health in the state, that's been very, very beneficial. The data speaks for itself in that. Uh, but what's happening right now could derail all of it. And from a business standpoint, the, the devastation that could come from that economically is significant. It already is detrimental, the level that, ha, you know, that has hit business. And we can't really survive another round of this without, without really serious consequences. So, Chris, the governor got, it, got into this very issue that Tanya's talking about this week on the businesses as you do the balance between the, the public health and you, the economic interests. But, but you really went after Utah County a bit this week as well, in, including uh, changing the, the color uh, restriction and also a, a mask mandate, not from him, but from the locals. Talk about why the governor has decided to let the local jurisdictions decide on issues like a mask mandate. Well, I think he's trying to let local government make decisions that are best for their, their area. If, if you were to implement a statewide mass mandate, I mean, you could make the argument, what, what purpose does that serve in, you know, Kane County or uh, where, there, where there aren't a lot of cases? And so I think it's probably the appropriate direction. He's tried to be judicious in the way that he moves forward. I certainly think that wearing a mask is appropriate, and I think they should do it. I would caution those, those young people, you know, that where we're seeing a lot of that spread, you know, they want, they say we believe in science, 
prove it. Put on your mask and show it. We, we're, we're, we see the data that masks helps alleviate the spread. It, it reduces the viral load that you might get in. So, so do it. Do the right thing. And I think that that's appropriate. And I hope the governor doesn't need to take more drastic steps. But I think he's he's shown that he will if 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 the conditions warrant. Uh -huh. So, Representative, this, this is the approach: is the governor has said, "Hey, all the state is not the same. You know, some circumstances may require, it, some not. I will let them do it." How do you feel about that approach, particularly as we're looking at? kind of the rise that we've seen. Right, well, look, there's been such a dismal failure of leadership at the federal level on COVID that it's a low bar to say that we've done better than Donald Trump has. We have done a bit better in Utah than Donald Trump has, but as I say, that's not saying much. And I'm frustrated and uh, disappointed that especially in light of earlier this week, the highest numbers we've ever had, the governor is still not willing to really show leadership and say, look, I don't have a problem with the idea that you don't treat uh, someplace in Kane County or Wayne County, uh, for example, rural Utah, the same as you treat the Wasatch Front. But what you have to have from the governor is greater levels of leadership in saying, we are serious in requiring masks. Now, now get with it, and not just masks, but testing and, and uh, contact tracing, the kind of things that have been done in other countries. There are a lot of other countries that have really dealt much more effectively than the United States and much more effectively than the state of Utah with this, uh, this problem. Tanya's absolutely right when she says, if you don't get this pandemic under control, you're gonna have serious economic problems. This is a false choice when people say, well, you have to choose between economic development or addressing the, the virus. Untrue. If you don't address the virus effectively, the economy is going to go downhill. And that's one of the frustrating things to me. I think that we've had a failure of leadership from the governor's office. And I like Governor Herbert very much, but on this one, he's missed the boat. Okay, that's gonna have to be the last comment on this. Thank you so much for your insights tonight. So amazingly helpful. And thank you for watching The Hinkley Report. This show is also available as a podcast on pbsutah.org slash Hinkley Report or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you next week.